So what I usually do is I give a talk about CAD for kids. And really what I'm trying to do is just answer the question that I get asked all the time by parents is, how do I get started? You know, what software do I use? I saw a 3D printer, what do I buy? You know, my kid's really excited about it, but how do I get started? And if I do nothing else in half an hour, the one thing I would like to say is, the way to get started is just get started. If, if, if I only do one thing, is to get a couple more people just to try and make stuff. It's, making is this experience of experimentation, it's testing, it's trying, you do it once, you do it again, most often you fail. Um, almost never do you get it right. I, I don't know how many times I've built a project. I, I don't even think I can think of a single project I've built that when I was done, I thought it was perfect. You're always done and you have something else to do. As a matter of fact, at the end, uh, I'll show you the thing I've been working on with my son for the last almost a year. And, uh, so, and everyone kept asking me, well, is it done? I said, no, but it's ready to go to Maker Faire. Because when we get, when we get home, well, we have plenty more to do on it. There's plenty of more work. And so the one thing I'd say to everybody is just go make stuff, just go try, keep trying. And it won't be perfect, and it's not about it being perfect, it's all about the experience of making stuff. Okay, so let me, let me talk a little bit about trying to answer that question a little bit. How do people get started? Because really, one of the things that's going on, people have been making things forever. And there's always been people in their garages tinkering, people making stuff, there's drill presses and people working on cars, but there's something different going on. And the two things I see going on relate to being able to use computers. And we're using computers in two different ways. All of a sudden, we're using computer a lot to design. And on the other hand, we're using microprocessors to fabricate. As you walk around here, there's microprocessors everywhere. There's microprocessors in the CNC routers, in the 3D printers. It's in all the things that people are making. They're filled with microprocessors as well. And that's really what the difference is. And so what underlies and what makes all those microprocessors really smart is the software that drives it. And so it's important to have the software that both helps you design but also that helps you make. So let me talk about a bunch of software about how to get started. One of the things I'll tell you is, all the software I'm going to talk about today is free. So every piece of software is free. This is, not a, this is not a big commercial for you to go out and buy anything. Everything's available for free. The other thing, I just want to take this opportunity, since it's great this room is filled. One of the things we did over the last year is we decided that it was so important to get all of the software that we make in the hands of kids, that we made all of our software, every piece of professional software, free for every student, every school, and every teacher. It... Yeah, I think it's great. All you gotta do to go get it, it's students.autodesk.com. People are like, really? Yeah, it's like, yeah. Just go to students.autodesk.com. You can download it. I think you get a three-year license or something like that. Three years goes by, you go there again, and you download it again. So all of it's free. All of it's available. And how do you, how do you build into it? Let me, let me just start with, um, here, let's just start. One of the things I tell people if they just want to start, Tinkercad, have many people, I, how many of the kids have used Tinkercad? No. Handful of you're kind of big for Tinkercad. Skylar, have you used Tinkercad? Not really. Oh, he's too, he's, too, he's too advanced. If people want to get into how do they do 3D modeling and stuff, I'd start with Tinkercad. Um, here, you, you can see some, your thing of mine doesn't look exactly the same. There it goes. Okay, here's the story of Tiana. She, she's been using it. Uh, Tiana decided to make biologically inspired jewelry. Um, and she's selling it, and she has the very modest goal of putting herself through college and raising a million dollars by selling, by selling her own jewelry. Okay, this is Ratik. Um, if any of you are here, when I point you, just raise your hands. Ratik has to wear glasses. He didn't kind of like the glasses he could buy, so he decided he had to design his own 3D glasses. It's to, to, design his own glasses, and then 3D print them. And so there's his Lego-inspired uh, pr 3D printed glasses. Okay, let me talk a little bit about 123D one, one, Design, which is a whole nother family of products. So if you want to get started, great place to start is Tinkercad. 
Um, another place to start, you, you sketch up. Those are kind of two easy to use entry level programs, both available for free. Next one is 123D Design. You have one, two, a whole series 123D Design, 123D Make, 123D Sculpt. So, depending on what you're doing, there's a whole variety of these. Here, here's, a, here's some examples of typical stuff. You can see a lot of it online of what people are doing. Um, here's, a, here, here's a good example of, of some stuff that uses some of the software. This is Tony. I don't know. If, is Tony in the room? So Tony's been building things. Oh, there's Tony. Tony and his, uh, and his son and a, and a bunch of kids in their high school have been building interesting things. This is a picture of Tony at last year's Maker Faire. This is B Battlestar Galactica Viper. So this is, this is his flight simulator he built. Um, this year he, he has uh, two new projects you're showing this year, Tony. One in Arduino-based um, iPhone, using your iPhone to control your home entertainment si system. I guarantee it's better than what most of us are doing to control our home entertainment today. All 42 remote controls. Um, and then this is a model he's building of an arc reactor, I think, from Iron Man. What's that? The boy, the boy, uh, yes. Everybody, everybody puts it on us, but it's really the boys who do all, all the work in this stuff. So that, th th this, is, this is the kid's um, uh, model of an arc reactor from Iron, Iron Man. Okay, one of the things that I think is really cool this year that we haven't done before because I think the future of building stuff is really not just modeling geometry. It's about how do you build a whole system. And a system these days consists of certainly the mechanical components, but it's also, it also involves the software and the electronics. It's really important that in order to understand how something's going to behave, that you're able to model the whole thing. So we just introduced a product called 123D Circuits. It's the coolest thing. I'm, you know, I'm better on the other stuff, but this was great. You want to do an Arduino-based project? All you do is pull up 123D circuits, web-based. You can lay out not only schematic views, but breadboard views. You can write your Arduino code in there. You can use other processors, and it actually runs a little simulator. So you can test it before you fry all your, before you fry all your capacitors. Um, it's really cool. It's a nice thing to do. You can then generate the enclosures and then you can 3D print things like the enclosures for your Arduinos. Um, you can model things like shields in there. We modeled one in there, me and my son, and then you can order them online. So uh, it's, it, it's a very cool thing and I think it's the beginning. You know, it's great that we can model all this stuff, but the question everybody always asks is, how do I make it go? You know, you just have this thing, it's behind the screen, it looks good, but how do I make it go? And so, this is the beginning of how do you make it go. Let me just show one of the projects. By the way, one of the things many of you may know, uh, Autodesk built out this big digital fabrication facility down on Pier 9 this year. So it's down in San Francisco, right next to the Exploratorium, which is an awesome location. And uh, it's a 35,000 square, 35, square foot facility, and in it, we have a program with artists in residence. We also have some machinists in residence and some inventors in residence and all kinds of people in residence who are using it and working together with us. This, this, this is one of their projects, uh, Vox Populi. So this is a um, megaphone that rotates around and it broadcasts. And the way you broadcast is you tweet to it. So you tweet to its account and so you could place this somewhere in public and when you tweet to it, it will say whatever came in on the tweet. <laughs> it's a very cool, a very cool project done by two Brazilian artists. Two Brazilian artists. Okay. Um, okay, l l let me move on to one other thing that's slightly different. One of the other things we do at Autodesk is we have a community of people on a, on a site called Instructables. How many people have looked at Instructables? Awesome. By the way, all the folks from Instructables, I see a whole bunch of them. Why don't you raise your hand? These are the people who are responsible for Instructables. <laughs> By the way, the Instructables crew all, works down, all work down at Pier 9. 
so they have access to the shop to try out all your awesome ideas. What Instructables is, it's a website where people publish the story of what they made and how they made it. And it really ranges, you know, it's everything from Oreo cookies, you know, to robots, to thermonuclear devices you can build in your backyard. I mean, it's this awesome, it's, there are some. Um, <laughs> It's, this awesome, it's an awesome site with all kinds of great things up there. And it's really fun just to read the story you know, of, of what went on. Um, one of the, so the only real requirement for the artists in residence who work at the pier is that when they're done, that they publish an instructable. And so it's a way of sharing with the community and putting stuff up there. It's a great resource. Um, I got a handful of instructables. and. I'm way behind on my to-do list if I have a few more that I need to get up there. Um, okay, there's Instructables. Here, here's actually the site. Let me, sh let me show you a picture of, of a, a couple of projects. So this is Benny. He's uh, 16 years old. This is the Instructable he published. He made a CNC router at home. And so he, so he built his own CNC router and now, now he's making uh, furniture and wood products that he's selling online. This is Daniel. Um, he, many of you may have seen this. He does, he, this is a book scanner that he did. He lives in Fargo, North Dakota, and he, he's published it. There's been a lot, there, there have been a lot of copies of this, and people have taken this design and worked with it, improved it, and really that's the entire idea behind this, is to take designs and iterate on them and you know, just go one step further and do one more thing with it. And so a lot of people have done this, but the original idea that I saw actually came from Daniel. Okay, let me move on to another thing that we've done is, um, this year we decided that there's so much cool stuff being built in the world. If you look all around us, in the maker community and people doing hardware startups, this amazing collection of stuff. And in some ways, we got the sense that, you know, the engineering tools uh, that people are using, they're really yesterday's engineering tools. And so yesterday's engineering tools are kind of failing today's engineers. They're failing today's companies and inventors. The way we work is different. It's small groups. It's very agile. We work quickly together. We collaborate. We do a lot of stuff differently. You know, many of the design tools of the past were really built, um, you know, for big aerospace companies. Most of us don't work, fortunately, like big aerospace companies. You know, we get stuff done in, you know, days and weeks and months. We work, we work in small teams. It's small groups working together. So we built a new product, a web-based uh, design tool called Fusion 360. And basically the idea behind it was, two th was really one big idea, which is we wanted to combine the ability to generate form, to do function, and to do fabrication. So the idea is you can do aesthetic forms, you can do prismatic shapes like you do in most solid modeling programs, um, but you could also test it and simulate and so you could analyze with finite element analysis so you understand stuff. You can simulate what it would be to take your object and drop it. But most importantly, we included the way to make stuff. And so there are tools in it that help with 3D printing as well as CAM tools that are built in to generate tool paths for all kinds of popular machines. Okay, so what, what have I been working on? So this is, this, is, this is my son, Willie. I don't know if he's here. There he is. There's Willie over there in the corner. Um, Willie and I have been working on this electric go-kart. So f we, we used Fusion. Uh, so there, there's, there's the model of the go-kart that we've been working on for the last little while. Um, sometime last summer, Willie came to me and uh, he, sa he said one great thing, which was he wanted to build an electric go-kart. After we started working on it the first day and we had bent up and started welding the frame, he looked at me and he said, Dad, you've wasted your life as a maker. <laughs> we were walking across the street from Pier 9 and we're crossing in Barcadero. I'm like, what's up? What do you mean I've wasted? And he says, you've worked all those years with wood. Metal is awesome. <laughs> and uh, we, we had done the first day welding and um, for those of you who go through that first thing of welding, you know, um, 
It doesn't take great skill or precision to weld the first pieces together. And so we, we spent the first day welding. And then just to prove the point, we went out in the middle of the pier and we took big hammers and we just tried to break apart all the pieces that we had welded together to just see how strong they were. Um, and it was really fun. So this was the go-kart we worked on. The important thing about it, it's, it's an electric go-kart. Um, it's got a... It's got a 19 horsepower motor that comes from our friends at uh, Lightning Motorcycles. The guys at Lightning are one of those companies I'm talking about, small company. They're trying to break the land speed record for um, electric motorcycles. So far, they've gone 218 miles an hour. Okay, now I saw, I saw before there was someone talking, they asked how many engineers in the audience, there were lots. What's the number one problem in a motorcycle going 218 miles an hour? What's the hardest engineering problem? Skylar? Nope. Skylar thought of steering. It's keeping the rider on the bike. As you start going to that speed, the, the rider keeps, starts going like that. The, the air actually starts forcing the rider off the bike. So that, that was the hard problem. So we got some of their reject parts and we uh, recycled them for our go-kart. Let me show you. One of the things that's cool in these new kind of CAD programs those are not real photos, those are all fake. <laughs> this is what we imagine a lot it looks like. One of the things, um, I'll show you a picture of the real go-kart. The way you can tell these fake pictures that are done synthetically with computer software is there never seem to be any wires in them. Real projects are filled with wires. All the fake photos never have any wires in them. Okay, so there it is. There, there, there's us imagining it touring around Europe somewhere. <laughs> There's another one. I, lo I love that image. It looks so real. Here's what it really looks like. It's not even red yet. That's all in our imagination. That's the go-kart. There's Willie and I working on it. Okay. And that's the first test drive going up and down Pier 9. Willie doing donuts. Okay. <laughs> so that, 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 that was the first time. Right now, like I said, these projects are never finished. This thing is geared a little too high. Um, goes about 50 something miles an hour. If anyone's ever been in something that's about two inches off the ground that goes 50 miles an hour with no shock absorbers, it's a really, really bad idea. Um, so we're trading, we're trading it in and we're making the gear ratio a little bit different so we get a little bit more low end torque and a little less high end speed. It was really fun early this morning running around the fairgrounds on the go-kart. So that's what it, that's what it looked like. Um, there, there's Willie sitting in it. And uh, okay, while Willie works on it, <laughs> like I, didn't I set this up perfectly by telling you Projects are never done. We were, at, we were actually driving here this morning. So anyhow, I have a few more, I have a few more minutes left. Um, that's all I wanted to kind of say prepared. I know there's always a million questions. I'm happy to answer questions. If you want to know anything about the go-karts, you want to know about software, you want to know about hardware, anyone has a question? So, so the question is, are we making a 3D printer now? So we, Willie and I, fortunately, are not making a 3D printer. Um, Auto, Autodesk is making a 3D printer. Just this week, we announced what we really were interested in is just moving 3D printing forward. So we announced two things this week. One was a software platform for 3D printing that we were going to license freely to all other 3D printer manufacturers. And then the second thing we said we were going to do um, is we're working on an SLA, three, you know, uh, a serial lithography 3D printer in which we were going to do a couple things. One is um, we're going to make the design open. So we will publish the design so other people can take the design and go with it. The other thing is it will accept all kinds of materials. So we, uh, we'll publish the specification for our formulation of materials, but other people can put in their own materials as well. Right, so, the, so Skylar's question with those pictures, all the pictures I showed there where the rendering was happening in the cloud. 
So one of the things that we're moving to with all the software is trying to divide the workload between the stuff that really is best done on your local computer or done on your tablet or done on your phone and the stuff that's best done in the cloud. In this case, the rendering of all those pictures are done in the cloud. You kind of manipulate it on your desktop machine. You set it up, you position a light, you hit a button. It computes on the cloud and the result comes back to you. So we're doing a lot of that, mostly the compute intensive things like the rendering. Most of the simulation is happening in the cloud as well. So um, it's, it, it's interesting kind of new architecture. Yeah, so the question is, uh, Fusion, will it have a scripting language? Um, there's already a scripting language built into it. It's a little bit invisible. Um, but there's a JavaScript and Python API coming. We're actually using it internally to drive a lot of Fusion today. Uh, sometime relatively soon, we're going to make it public. There's a new release of Fusion coming out on Monday. It's not in this one, but in the next one or the one after. You'll, you'll have a Python and a JavaScript binding to kind of do everything that we're able to do. So, down, you know, kind of down to bare bones. Oh, so we, we don't, we have not built, a, so the question was, do we have access to Vault in the cloud? We haven't built a Vault in the cloud, but we have built a place where you can store all your files, you can render everything. Um, all of that's available to schools as well. The only thing, I'll give you the, the, the true thing, what we've done, because the students, when they see something free, have been huge consumers of a bunch of this stuff like the rendering. And so our paying customers get priority in the queue ahead of the students. Um, but other than that, all of the cloud-based services are available to all the students as well. So by the way, Willie, did you get the go-kart running? No. no. <laughs> Willie fried the go-kart. He left him alone for two minutes. <laughs> it's OK. 2D tools. You know, people can the question is, what's the future of Autodesk 2D tools? You know, um, I think 2D is becoming less important for documentation. I think more and more people are working off 3D models and building off 3D models. Two places I see 2D continuing long into the future. Most of us sketch in 2D as a way to come up with concepts and ideas and make things, you know, kind of come to life. And the other is still an industry. It's still really important that people use it to communicate to others. So once you have an idea and you want to give it to a, a shop to fabricate, there's still a lot of the world that digests 2D drawing. So that, that, that's what goes on as well. We're going to continue to invest in it. But, you know, most, most of our customers today are doing most of their modeling and communication in 3D. Okay, thanks very much. If anyone wants to see the go-kart, we're out there.